Okay, well, we're going to start. Welcome one and all to the special Cabbage Lecture on Lucy Maud Montgomery. As many of you know, this year marks the 150th anniversary of her birth, and Cabbage has elected to organize a book arts exhibition to recognize this milestone. The exhibition is called Kindred Spirits, the Lucy Maud Montgomery Legacy, as interpreted by contemporary book artists. Because many of us only know Montgomery through her most famous novel, Anne of Green Gables, we decided to embark on a year of discovery. As we strive to know Maud better, we're thrilled to have Catherine Harvey from Archives and Special Collections at the University of Guelph to present a storied life, during which she will give us an inside peek at items in the L.M. Montgomery collection, and I'll be introducing Catherine shortly. I'm also delighted to announce that the GTA chapter of Cabbage is organizing a special Lucy Maud Montgomery event. It's going to be a tour of the Leesdale Manse. Now, Leesdale was Maud's home for 15 years and is an official National Historic Site. Admission is $20, which includes lunch and a tour. So mark your calendars. The date is Saturday, July 27th at 11.30 a.m. Space is limited, so visit the Cabbage website and reserve your spot. Now, reaction to our lecture series so far has been very positive. So thank you so much for your interest. You may know friends who wanted to attend, but the time was inconvenient. Do let them know that we are recording the talk, which will be posted to the Cabbage YouTube channel for later viewing. You'll find the link to our YouTube channel in the chat. Now, what is Cabbage? Most of you in this Zoom room are Cabbage members, but I know many of you are not. For non-members, you're likely wondering, why do I keep saying Cabbage? And no, I'm not referring to a large cruciferous vegetable. It is the acronym for the Canadian Bookbinders and Book Artists Guild. So a little bit about us. We are a not-for-profit organization that supports and promotes and seeks to inspire participation in traditional bookbinding and contemporary book arts. Cabbage provides high quality book arts education, information, resources, and networking opportunities to the Canadian book arts community and to the interested public. If you want more details about Cabbage or maybe enroll in one of our introductory workshops, please check out our website. And a link to the Cabbage website has also been posted in the chat. So a little bit also about Kindred Spirits. You will also find information about the Kindred Spirits Traveling Book Arts Exhibition on our website. It launches in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island on June 19, and then will travel to various provinces across Canada. Jurors met yesterday to select the pieces that will appear in the exhibition, pieces created by Cabbage members to acknowledge Montgomery's enduring legacy. I've seen the works, and they are a wonderful tribute to Mont. Now, I'm sure everyone can appreciate the costs associated with any initiative, especially one the size of Kindred Spirits. If you're so moved, I invite you to visit the Cabbage website where you can donate to the Kindred Spirits exhibition or to our organization. And you'll find that link in the Zoom chat as well. So with all that housekeeping out of the way, I am pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Catherine Harvey, and a little bit about Catherine. Catherine has a PhD in English from the University of Alberta and an MLIS from Dalhousie University. She's been working for more than 20 years as an archivist at Dalhousie and the University of Guelph, which she headed from 2009 to 2020. She was the president of the Association of Canadian Archivists from 2015 to 2016, and a senior associate editor of the scholarly archival journal Archivaria from 2020 to 2022. She's given talks on various archival subjects in Canada, the United States, Europe, and Southeast Asia. Catherine was involved in making 50 items from Guelph's LMM collection available for the 2014 multi-city exhibit tour of Japan and attended the Tokyo opening. In 2017, she assisted in the creation of an archival and special collections in-house exhibit called Rilla of Ingleside. Now, as time permits, Catherine will answer questions after her talk, so I encourage you to put your questions in the chat. So welcome, Catherine. We look forward to your talk this evening and learning more about the L.M. Montgomery Collection at the University of Guelph. Great, thank you so much, Barbara. You're welcome. All right, so let's get this 
on the road. Yes. We have a storied life, a tale of Lucy Maud Montgomery's archives at the University of Guelph. Okay, now I just need to advance my slides. Okay, so an overview of uh, what I'm going to talk about. So why the University of Guelph? It's not really the first place you think of when you think of Anne of Green Gables or Lucy Maud Montgomery. Um, we have a growing collection. I'll talk a bit about the uh, manuscripts in our collection. An acquisition that we received, which is a possibly, there's controversy about this, um, the suicide note or not. <laughs> uh, we have the saga of Gog and Magog. I'm going to show a bit of uh, Montgomery's needlework and quilting, uh, some photography, and then um, highlight a couple of conferences and exhibits. And then I will take questions. And if I don't know the answer, um, I can try to get back to you on it. <laughs> or maybe someone else, maybe someone else in the group will have the answer. So I'm not a Montgomery scholar. I know something about how we got her collection. So I will just start uh, with that. So the story begins with a friendship. Mary Rubio, an English professor at the University of Guelph, became interested in Montgomery in the 1970s when the field of children's literature was in its infancy. She was raising girls of her own at the time and her personal and professional lives both led her to Lucy Maud Montgomery. Rubio and her colleague at the University of Guelph, Elizabeth Waterston, were both interested in children's literature at the time so they filled the scholarly gap by founding in 1975 CCL, Canadian Children's Literature, a journal devoted to literary criticism of what the name says, Canadian Children's Literature. The journal's third issue was devoted entirely to the works of Montgomery. As Rubio's interest in Montgomery grew, uh, Waterston informed her that Montgomery's son, Stuart, and you can see him uh, on the left in the top picture. Um, uh, he, um, she, she met him in the 1960s 60s, uh, when she wrote an article on his mother. Rubio sent a copy of the issue of CCL um, <clears throat> to Stuart and they met a short time later. As his mother's literary executor, he asked Rubio to publish his mother's biography and edit her journals, um, the latter of which she did with uh, Elizabeth Waterston. So they started editing the journals and those in themselves were a 19 year undertaking. They took them from, the first volume was issued in 1985, the last in 2004. Knowing that access to the journals and other personal belongings would be critical for their research, Rubio contacted the chief librarian, Margaret Beckman, about possibly buying them from Stewart. He was amenable to the idea uh, and um, knowing of Waterston's and Rubio's interest and that the journals would be close enough to Toronto, where he lives, uh, lived, uh, for him to visit when he wanted. The acquisition was notable enough that the University of Guelph's president, Donald Forster, officiated the handover ceremony. And this is a screenshot of um, the university news bulletin announcing the acquisition of Montgomery's um, diaries and other personal papers. The diaries, um, seemed to be the highlight, but there were many other um, very interesting acquisitions at that time. Um, so this is from our accessions database. Uh, when material comes into the archives, we need to know what it is, where it is, who gave it to us, how, how much there is. Um, so 
our um, acquisition record from that transaction lists the contents as the original collection of L.M. Montgomery, which includes 10 volumes of handwritten journals, 1889 to 1942, four scrapbooks of memorabilia, one scrapbook of Montgomery reviews, and then a 1983 purchase of 100 to 150 books from Montgomery's personal library. Uh, manuscripts uh, and papers, um, the lies are quoted, Xeroxes of scrapbooks and so on. This, according to Chief Librarian Margaret Beckman, um, said, uh, she, sorry, according to Chief uh, Librarian Margaret Beckman, the acquisition is a boon uh, for Guelph social historians and Canadian literary scholars. Uh, rural sociologists, family studies faculty, and complements Guelph's already outstanding Scottish collection. The collection indeed over the years has been used extensively and has grown beyond the scope of that initial acquisition. And since then we've received a variety of donations of Montgomery's original manuscripts, additional portions of her personal library, needlework and quilting. So her personal library um, consists of more than 175 volumes now. Uh, that were um, ones that she regularly um, consulted. I mean, they were her personal library. And it shows a really wide diversity of reading interests from usual classics of English literature to popular writers such as Agatha Christie. She was a real Agatha Christie fan. Um, there are scattered annotations and inserts in almost every work. Uh, and, and almost every work is inscribed with the author's distinctive signature and logo of a tiny black cat. And so I've just included here um, the one example of how she signed her name in her books in her personal library. So a growing collection. With the collection rapidly increasing in um, volume, and given Rubio and Waterston's continued work on the selected journals, the decision was made to embrace the uh, uh, Montgomery materials as its own collecting area. Rather than as part of Scottish studies, it was set aside at it as its own entity, its own collecting area. Um, and the decision was also made to embrace um, collecting materials, not only um, of her personal archives, but also documentation of her legacy um, in the form of novels in translation, records uh, from Montgomery conferences, publications, musicals that were written about, Anne of Green Gables and so on, toys, puzzles, and other forms of entertainment. Thus Montgomery came into her own as one of our major collecting areas. Um, on this slide that you see um, is an image of uh, the, at the bottom is an image of the Order of the British Empire badge and ribbon, which she received from King George V, I believe in 1935. Um, and it was only to be worn in public in the presence of the monarch or one of their representatives, such as the governor general. A poster for a dance production of Anne, the first page of her first journal, um, and a photograph of uh, Montgomery with you and Chester and Stewart taken in 1925. So these are just a few items um, representing the types of materials that uh, we began to acquire. One of Montgomery's manuscripts, Rilla of Ingleside, was thought to have been lost. However, it had only been tucked away in the possession of Emily and Murray Woods for over 30 years. They generously donated it to archival and special collections in 1999 because of their own family's personal connections to the university and the existence of an already strong uh, Montgomery collection. Most of Montgomery's book manuscripts are at uh, the University of Prince Edward Island. Um, we have 
uh, the Rilla of Ingleside uh, manuscript um, and also uh, another one. So this is um, first three, uh, well, so just some notes towards uh, Rilla along with a table of contents. And then this is page one, chapter one, page one of the, uh, of the draft. Another of Montgomery's manuscripts, the Blies are quoted, was published posthumously in 2009. According to an obituary in the New York Times, um, the manuscript had been delivered to her publisher the day before her death. A shortened, uh, and it was rejected. <laughs> um, a shortened and heavily edited version of the book appeared under the title The Road to Yesterday in uh, 1974. However, it was not until 1999 that Benjamin Lefebvre began looking through the typescripts and realized that the 1974 publication was not presented in the form envisioned by Montgomery, so over the next 10 years, he meticulously reviewed all the transcripts and published what um, might be called the author's version. And we see that on the right side of the screen, uh, rediscovered lost work of L.M. Montgomery edited by Benjamin Lefebvre. So we have that manuscript, uh, typescript as well. Also in 2009, we had another addition to the growing collection when Ru Mary Rubio donated the page of writing that Stuart found at his mother's bedside after her death. Controversy exists over this note, which appears to be a numbered page of a journal. It is dated April 22nd, 1942, page number 176. And interestingly, it's written on the back of a royalty statement from 1939 for Jane of Lantern Hill. So it's just on a piece of scrap paper. The family maintains that Montgomery committed suicide. Montgomery's biographer, Mary Rubio, is not convinced and suggests it could be part of a journal entry now lost. Whatever the case, um, it's sort of hard to see, but I'm gonna just read it in full. Um, the, this copy is unfinished and never will be. It is in a terrible state because I made it when I had begun to suffer my terrible breakdown of 1940. It must end here. If any publishers wish to publish extracts from it under the terms of my will, they must stop here. The 10th volume can never be copied and must not be made public during my lifetime. Parts of it are too terrible and would hurt people. I have lost my mind by spells, and I do not dare think what I may do in those spells. May God forgive me, and I hope everyone else will forgive me, even if they cannot understand. My position is too awful to endure, and nobody realizes it. What an end to a life in which I always tried to do my best, in spite of many mistakes. So that was the note, journal page, whatever it is uh, hmm. deemed to be that was on her bedside table when uh, Stuart um, found her. And the uh, Lucy Maud Montgomery uh, Literary Society actually has a website devoted to this controversy. And I've uh, put the URL at the bottom of the screen here. So if you want to further explore some of the details around that um, note or uh, journal entry, um, you can do that. The saga of Magog and Gog, or Gog and Magog, 1911. Montgomery bought the 100-year-old ceramic dogs while on her honeymoon with Ewan MacDonald. They visited both Scotland and England, and she picked these up um, in a, an antique store in York, in England. 
So she brought them home safely. They were kept in her home. There are lots of pictures of uh, her home with these dogs by the, um, by the fireplace. And then in 1939, there is a diary entry which tells of a visiting child who dropped and <laughs> broke Gog. Um, a few years later, her teenage grandsons, when they were mucking about, playing, wrestling, no doubt, the pieces were play, um, they, they broke them again. This time the dogs both shattered. Mm -hmm. So the pieces were placed in a box and stored in Stewart's basement. 1979, 40 years later, it just happened that Mary Rubio, by that time, had met Stewart, had started working on um, the uh, journals and so on. So Stewart's wife, Ruth, was cleaning out the basement and was about to throw out the broken dogs. Um, and Mary Rubio did her best to convince them not to throw out the shards. And so in 1983, uh, the dogs were acquired and they were glued back together by someone in the library who meant well, um, but didn't do it, shall we say, with conservation in mind. Um, so they, um, arrived in archival and special collections. In 2014, a Japanese company was organizing an eight city museum tour of items from Montgomery's archives, and they wanted to display the dogs. Like that was of anything they wanted to borrow a journal and the dogs. However, um, the dogs could not travel for health reasons. They're too fragile. So two years later, um, we successfully applied to the Canadian Conservation Institute for their conservation. So we actually have a report written by the conservation, by the CCI, uh, describing the process, taking the dogs completely apart again, down to their original shards, and then putting them back together and getting rid of all the yellowing glue that had been on them. Uh, so they were returned from CCI three years later in wow. 2019 in much improved condition. Now, the, one of the reasons it took so long was that um, this, what we applied for was a, a lottery uh, for them to do free conservation on an item. So we would not have been able to finance the conservation ourselves. So we were really happy <laughs> when wow. um, these dogs were uh, accepted. Okay, so Montgomery uh, was not only a writer, uh, she also was um, a quilter and did a lot of needlework. Uh, so these, um, we've got a crazy patchwork square, front and back. Front is the green, the back is the really multicolored, uh, made by Montgomery in 1900. And then on the right hand of the screen is a shawl, the tag reads, shawl found in red-blue chest at park corner, see diary, and then word illegible to me, uh, back at least to 1850s. So um, this was something in her possession, not likely something that she did, but um, she, she did embroidery and lace work and, and needlework. And then from single squares to full cushions, uh, these are um, the back and the front of a patchwork cushion made in 1901 by Montgomery. Montgomery um, was an avid photographer and she took lots and lots of pictures. Uh, we have glass plate negatives um, as well as um, 
uh, safety negatives of her um, photographic career, shall we say. Um, and her photographs are always really interesting. Um, cats were a really important part of her life. And we see um, Montgomery on the left with Myrna Webb, and they are in Guelph around 1926, and each of them is holding a cat. So I thought that was a, a fitting one to uh, photo to include here. Um, the first photograph, the one on the left, is um, Montgomery modeling her wedding trousseau. And the second photograph, the middle photograph, is um, herself and Ewan in Glasgow on their honeymoon in 1911, the same period in which um, she purchased the dogs. And there are 1,245 photographs from this collection available on the web. And I've provided the link here um, to, to that diverse collection. So in 2000, 2008 uh, was the 100th anniversary of the publication of Anne of Green Gables. Uh, so many anniversary celebrations were taking place across the country, including at the University of Guelph. Speakers included Mary Rubio, Elizabeth Waterston, Chief Librarian and CIO Mike Ridley, Associate Chief Librarian Helen Salmon, and Head of Archival and Special Collections Lauren Bruce all gave talks followed by a keynote address from the university's chancellor, Pamela Wallen. <laughs> so this is um, a notice from uh, a news bulletin from the university just talking about uh, this conference. And they also um, curated an exhibit at the uh, McDonald Stewart Art Center, now the uh, um, Art Gallery of Guelph. Um, and uh, this website was um, developed to give sort of an introduction to that, um, that exhibit. Unfortunately, um, you may be able to see at the top of the screen, it says Wayback Machine, because this website no longer exists except mm -hmm. In the web archive. So <laughs> um, you can uh, go to the Wayback Machine and like this screen has the uh, URL that you would need to type in to get the older version. So it is accessible, but you have to go through a lot of hoops to get it. <laughs> um, and then, um, as I mentioned, in Japan in 2014, there was an eight city tour. I think that's eight, yeah. Um, and I've just listed here the cities and the number of people in attendance. Now, all of these museums take, um, they charge admission. Wow. So 160,000 people across Japan, put out good money to see an exhibit of Anne of, um, to see an exhibit of Lucy Maud Montgomery, as well as her Japanese um, uh, translator. So, <clears throat> um, and the, the uh, example, the screenshot on the, on the right side, sorry, are some pictures taken of that exhibit. Okay, so that seems a bit abrupt, <laughs> but I do want to leave time for questions. And um, we have a lot of material uh, that I haven't talked about here, um, but I do want to just add right, right now that the materials are available at the University of Guelph in our 
accessible in our reading room. Um, and you don't have to be a scholar doing, you know, some highfalutin scholarly study uh, to access these materials. These materials are here for everyone to come in and, and view. Um, if you are interested in looking at in person, her dogs, China dogs, the Woolmer jug, the, um, you know, lots and lots of um, trinkets and so on, uh, memorabilia uh, created um, for various Montgomery um, uh, events and so on. Um, you can come in and, and look at all of these yourselves. Um, the photographs, as I mentioned, are available on the web. Um, if you do come in, uh, you can, um, you have to book an appointment and order the materials. But as I say, you don't, like, you can just be doing this out of personal interest. Like, you don't have to have a, well, I would say personal interest is a good reason, but you don't have to have a good reason to, um, come and see the materials. And, you know, we just want to make sure that everyone knows that the archives is very welcoming and we have knowledgeable people who um, know a lot about our collections. We also have a lot of um, information sheets about our collections. Um, and yeah, so um, I, I will leave that there and I will take questions. Okay, Catherine, I see some, uh, there are some questions starting to come into okay. the chat room. Uh, the first uh, person uh, notes that uh, on, on the slide where you had with the shawl, uh, the, there is a note there that says dating back to at least 1850. So mm -hmm. we see a, a comment there on that. Uh, Yuka Kajahara says that was a fabulous exhibit. So I'm assuming she is referring to ah. the 2014 tour. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's, uh, yeah. I'm assuming, a firsthand comment there. Um, Maria Laws is asking, are there any LMM descendants alive now? Yes. Uh, Kate McDonald Butler. Uh, in fact, she was, um, I... I've met her on several occasions, and uh, she was at the opening of the Tokyo exhibit because she has personal uh, uh, some items in you know that that she has uh, that were her grandmother's. So she donated some of those for the exhibit, or loan, loaned them for the exhibit, and uh, so. Um, she was there at the opening and I was also at the Tokyo opening representing, you know, the University of Guelph. So, so that, that she's the, the, the major contact uh, through the family. Now, just while we're talking about that uh, 2014 exhibit, before I go on to uh, explore some <laughs> of the additional questions that are on the chat, uh, are you able to elaborate a bit more on the nature of some of the uh, items that were on exhibition there? Yeah, we had um, about 50 items and they uh, we sent over two journals, one or two journals. Um, there was, uh, actually, I'm just going to go back um, uh, on this here. Uh, this is needlework of hers that we sent over. So, uh, and then there's a scrapbook, a journal, and there were a number of other um, items uh, that, that were sent over. So about 50 in total. Okay. Very good. And not all got exhibited in all places. But oh, I see. Mm -hmm. They they were sort of rotated out <clears throat> depending on depending on the space that they were in. Got it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Now we've got uh, Mike Damasio who's asking. I have accessed the materials at U of Guelph, which are fantastic, and my concern is for the preservation of them. Some of the materials quite fragile. So, are there any plans for conservation of her journals? 
Uh, well, um, in terms of the journals, um, they have all been digitized. Uh, so we have, um, I know that's not a conservation, like for a conservator, that's not a good answer. Um, but they are fragile and they are being maintained in climate controlled setting. Uh, the one thing that bothered me a lot going through the journals is that someone interleaved them with tissue paper. That is That was unnecessary and it actually was part of a cause of like doubling the size of the volumes so that they became even more fragile. So I started taking some of those pieces of paper out, but um, didn't do a systematic uh, cleaning of those. Um, but uh, they are um, among our top uh, visited items, I would say. And it's a delicate balance between conservation and allowing people to view the originals. Um, when I, I know when I first started at the university, um, only the photocopies of the journals were allowed to be used by researchers, which was an incredible disappointment when people, you know, came, researchers came all the way from Japan, Poland, you know, Norway <laughs> to look at the journals and they were told, oh, just the photocopies. Mm -hmm. So I thought kind of defeats the purpose of having them if you can't see the originals. Um, so we do make them available, but um, as I say, it's a it's kind of a double-edged sword. You want people to see them and be excited, but you also want to make sure that they're preserved. And can I just add, I have a point of clarification as well. Guelph has all the journals, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Yeah, there are 10 volumes and Guelph has them all. Okay, super. Okay, next uh, question. Uh, I think in the second slide, this is from Kirsten Grunter. I think in the second slide gave a date for her collection as 1832 to 1942. So what does the 1832 date cover since she was born in 1874? Um, okay, so the second slide? That's what it says in the second slide. It was may not have been in the second. It may have, it was one of the oh, first okay. slides. I saw the, the the collection dates. It seemed to be, it predated. Oh, okay. 1889 okay. to 19. Okay, so. Uh, I think know. it was the second slide, the next, the next slide. There was something in it. Yeah, right there. At the bottom. Oh, tiny low oh, of a black cat, 1832 to 1949. Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I am um, just being nosy. I just thought, what <laughs> did her grandmother write something? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? No, I think I think probably what that I, I copied. Uh, be honest here. I copied this from um, a, a, a brief description of her personal library. And I think what this means is that um, she has books in her personal library from 1832 mm. to 19, yeah. well, not 1949, um, but things were added to her library um, after that. And I'm gathering that she's got her logo. And that could also, um, yeah, best, that's my best answer. <laughs> yeah, that, seems, that seems reasonable, sure. Okay, we have another question here from Janine Forrest to Court. Do the dogs have a backstory other than belonging to Montgomery? And were they worth a lot before she acquired them? Um, the first hundred years are a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I was only able to tell about the second hundred years. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, she just, she fell in love with them when she went into the shop in, in York. And uh, I don't know that we know what the provenance, apart from her owning them, you know, it, it, that part of it remains a mystery, okay. to me at least. There may be others out there who have tracked down the source, but not me. <laughs> now, I, I'm going to jump in with a, a question as well. I'm curious uh, that you all won a lottery to have the conservation done, which I, I think is, is amazing. And I'm assuming that this was a lottery of either other institutional libraries that are yeah. looking for conservation centers. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you're from, asking, you're curiously, yeah, curiously, then if you had had to pay for it, what would have been the cost for that? Poof. Um, we did not actually get um, any sort of uh, estimate done of right. what it would cost. Uh, but knowing the number of hours that were put in and the pay <laughs> yeah. for the conservator, um, it would have been in the tens of thousands of dollars. Wow. Yeah. Signi easily. That's significant. Yeah. 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 That's great. Thank you. Okay. So we've got uh, another question here from Kirsten. Can you tell us who put together that Japanese exhibit? It was actually uh, developed by um, a company called beans <laughs> and uh, they um, they they were the ones who organized everything they uh, hired researchers hired translators they came over um, the president of the company actually visited uh, the University of Guelph and Prince Edward Island uh, Kate McDonald Butler um, my uh, Montgomery's granddaughter, uh, and you know they they sort of narrowed down the items that they wanted for the exhibit, and um, so there were people on you know that uh, were hired by them to do a lot of the research, and uh, then our our staff um, assisted them in. Uh, facilitating the loan. So there was no public institution from Canada involved other than the University of Guelph. Like no Canadian museum <clears throat> was pr completely private, a private initiative. From actually, that not entirely through because uh, it's really hard to see, but <clears throat> I put um, the uh, report from Tokyo up here and uh, it indicates the cooperation of the Canadian Tourism Commission, Prince Edward Island Tourism Board, Confederation Center of the Arts, University of Guelph, um, LM Montgomery Institute, Parks Canada, um, and then um, several Japanese um, institutions. Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Canadian Embassy both supported it as well. And there was actually a reception at the Canadian Embassy in Tokyo um, celebrating the, the exhibit. Wonderful. So it, it was it was a it was on the map, I'll put it that way, yeah. in uh, the Canadian uh, contingent in Japan. And yeah. certainly got uh, got a lot of uh, eyeballs on it too. Yes, yes, that's fabulous. Yeah, and the, this private company also, um, in addition to just having the exhibit, they created a lot of artifacts. Like you name it, they would make it out of something Montgomery, like placemats, bookmarks, um, dolls. The you know, like any anything you can think of. Um, there was a lot for sale. So it was part moneymaker for them. Okay. Oh, that's yeah. great. 
Okay, we have another question here from Mike. Any manuscripts or written materials still yet to be published in the near future? I think there might be some stories that and poems that haven't seen the light of day, but I am not 100% sure on that. Okay. Uh, but I think there are still some discoveries to be made. Okay. Kirsten has a question. Can you tell us a bit more about why the family believed it was a suicide note but that Mary Rubio was unsure of that. Yeah. Um, well, I think, uh, I, I don't know a huge amount about this um, sort of difference of opinion, but Mary Rubio took the view after researching her, bi you know, her biography, uh, researching her life intensively for the biography. Um, she took the view that, these were really instructions to Stuart about publishing her journals. And that she knew that the last journal that she wrote um, didn't represent her the way she wanted to be remembered, perhaps, put it that way. Um, because she wrote and then rewrote the journals. Um, so she craft, basically crafted an image of herself through the journals. And that final one didn't get that same attention. So it's, and it's also difficult because I can see sort of both sides. She was suffering a great amount of mental stress, mental distress. Uh, she suffered depression. Her husband suffered depression. She had been taking um, opiates, you know, medicines, uh, laudanum or whatever, um, to uh, help her calm and sleep and all of that. And the possibility is that it was an accidental overdose. Um, or it could have been suicide. So the family says that um, there, it was a known family secret, um, but there we have it. <laughs> and, you know, like the, the note itself um, reads partly like a journal entry and does have a page number at the top. It says 176. Um, so... Yeah, let's just go back to that. It does have uh, at the top um, 176. And then I don't know if you can, can you see that? Yes. On the screen? Yeah, okay. okay. I just can't see it on mine. <laughs> um, so, and then it's dated, of course, two days before she died. And does that, does that 176 uh, correlate to what would have been written? There, there was a page 175 and four, et cetera? That is the big question. Okay. We don't have them. Oh, okay. Got yeah. it. All right. So they have either been lost or never existed. Okay. Got yeah. it. Okay, next question from Caitlin Sonneveld. Are the digitized versions of the journals available anywhere online? No. <laughs> no? And no. no. <laughs> okay. And I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and and I see Mike's complicated. responding and saying you can get the published ones that uh, are available yeah. and they're definitely a great read. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a sort of complicated copyright question there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we have them, but they are available. Yeah. So I can see what Penny said. Yeah, sorry. Oh, okay, very good. Okay. Um, did, uh, from Maria Laws, did Kate McDonald Butler share any memories of her grandmother? Um, well, we didn't spend a lot of time together and I'm not really a Montgomery scholar. Um, so, I know that she has written many, like she has done a lot of writing herself about her grandmother. 
And it was also uh, when the, this suicide note came out, if it is a suicide note, um, mental health issues were, you know, coming to the fore in the public consciousness. And um, she thought it was a good time to let people know that, you know, even brilliant writers like Montgomery, uh, not just brilliant writers, but photographers, artists, you know, um, they can suffer <laughs> badly. And, uh, you know, she, uh, the, the family, you know, I guess earlier on were protecting her image, but then as gradually, th th these are my assumptions, right. um, but it, it seems to me that it really helped um, raise the profile of mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she has written on that. Right, okay. Kate McDonald Butler, yeah. Right. Yeah, so Mike uh, Damasio is, is making an observation that the last journal entry is very hard to read in pencil, shaking hand, and sounds somewhat similar to a suicide note. Um, from Joanne LeBold, Kate McDonald Butler was born after her grandmother died, so doesn't have any personal memories, but at events, she often relates her father's memories of her. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Which makes sense. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, and that, and that makes perfect sense. <laughs> I certainly do have a question, and that relates back to her personal library of books. And uh, so you all have 175 volumes. Are, are, is her library, that personal library, complete at Guelph, or is it shared amongst other libraries? Well, we know we don't have the complete library. Okay. Um, but I don't know where... I, there might be items in other people's personal possessions. Right. Like friends and so on. So um, it is not a complete library, but it is a substantial of substantial. Right. And it does really show the diversity of her interests. I certainly know I had read that she she frequently gifted some of her own personal library to to friends or relatives and that's right yeah 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 that's great wonderful okay well I think we're coming to the uh, end oh we've got another observation from Yuka Kajahara UPEI and the Osborne collection of early children's books uh, at the TPL have some as well great. Uh, Mike Damasio first editions of her novels included in the library collection. Are they? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so we um, made a, a concerted effort to start collecting all of the translations of her books, all the variants. Um, you know, we were, were trying to get all first editions um, and the variants. Uh, so we have put a real push on, on that. Um, we also have some, you know, crazy spin-off novels that were written by people imagining, you know, a zombie attack, you know, with <laughs> Mon An Anna Green Gables involved <laughs> or something. You know, it's like, <laughs> so we have some pretty eclectic uh, spin-off materials as well, which is, makes it a lot of fun. Yeah. It makes it. Oh, that's that's fabulous. Well, I, I I'm looking at the clock here, and I think we're we're running down to the last uh, few minutes. Um, and certainly, what I want to say, Catherine, is thank you so much for taking the time and uh, giving us this glimpse of the wonderful artifacts that are at the University mm -hmm. of Guelph and and sharing your perspective on them, and mm -hmm. certainly extending to to the group who are listening and will be listening on on YouTube that. The, this doesn't need to be hidden away from our view that if you that's want right. to make an appointment and see some of these things in person, yes. that, uh, you certainly are welcome to do that. And, yes. and I find that sort of a, a very wonderful thing to know that we do have that uh, access. Mm -hmm. to that. Yes. yes. And uh, I do want to announce something else that's uh, very exciting on, on behalf of Cabbage. Uh, and on behalf of the Kindred Spirits exhibition is that if you live in Southern Ontario, 
or plan to be visiting Southern Ontario at the time, uh, the Archives and Special Collections Gallery at the University of Guelph will be a host venue for the Kindred Spirits exhibition. And that's going to be starting in January, 2026. So mark your calendars for that because we, we certainly hope to see you there. Um, and we do thank the University of Guelph for being very interested in, uh, in uh, taking on that Cabbage exhibition. So, so again, thank you, Catherine. This has been wonderful. Welcome. And on behalf of the room, I say uh, we very much appreciate you taking the time to, to share this with us. And thanks to the room for, for attending tonight. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we appreciate your support. So until the next time, thank you so much. And thank good you, evening. everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you.